Thank you all so very much for being here today. Organizing an event like TEDx, any in the world, is a challenge. But doing so in the middle of a pandemic and through the worst violence Palestine has seen in many years is a tremendous feat. So I'd like to ask you to start by first thanking our volunteers and the organizers of this event. Join me in thanking them, please. Raise your hand if over the past 15 months you felt exhausted and overwhelmed. Raise your hand if over the past 15 months you left your work, lost your work, or lowered your working hours just to keep up. If you raised your hand to either or both of your, those questions, you are definitely not alone. In addition to the tremendous stress of dealing with the first major pandemic in over 100 years, losing loved ones to the disease, not knowing what to do to protect ourselves and our loved ones, losing those social connections that propped us up, and constantly worrying about whether we or our loved ones would be infected. Many women, many mothers also had to deal with educating our children from home, losing our childcare, and increased stress from economic pressures, including, unfortunately, rising domestic violence and abuse. Study after study have shown that women have disproportionately borne the brunt of the COVID-19 pandemic and its related effects. As UN Women wrote in a recent report, <clears throat> across the globe, women earn less, save less, have less secure jobs, and are more likely to be employed in the informal sector. They have less access to social protections and are the majority of single parent households. Their capacity to absorb economic shocks is therefore less than that of men. In fact, on average globally, for every dollar a man earns, a woman earns just 54 cents. Many argue that this pandemic has actually set back years of progress in terms of women's inclusion and equality, which was already uneven around the world and way too slow. Indeed, analysts have modeled what doing nothing to address the disproportionate effects of COVID on women means for the global economy, a $13 trillion loss to global GDP. Now let's turn to the Arab world in Palestine. While the formal female labor force participation rate in the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa, is already the lowest worldwide at 20%, it is estimated that Arab women will lose an additional 700,000 jobs as a result of COVID. Young women are even more vulnerable as they are ev vulnerable during this volatile job market. In Palestine, nearly half of employed women hold part-time jobs, and one in four women employed in the private sector works without an employment contract, both of which puts women at a much higher risk in terms of their labor rights. Yet, research shows that companies that, with more women in their management teams perform better, yet the Arab world is also in some of the lowest spots for females in management positions with Palestine in some of the lowest spots around the world. <clears throat> in fact, Palestine has the lowest percentage of firms with a female top manager in the world out of 146 countries surveyed. Yet, if you look at secondary and tertiary education rates across the MENA region, including in Palestine, women hold not only over half of the spots, but overrepresent in the top spots. Imagine if we included all of these young women in our workforce. Gender-based discrimination is making the Arab world less competitive. We are losing an estimated $575 billion every year because of it. Yet, investing in women also makes business sense. In MENA, eight in 10 women are responsible for their household shopping and are heavily involved in purchase decisions across categories. 
and investing in women lifts entire communities. It is shown that women reinvest up to 90% of their earnings back to their families and communities, compared to just 35% for men. So while we may not work, work less, and make less money than men, our spending power is still incredibly high. I am the proud daughter of a Mexican immigrant mother. Like many others, she risked her life to enter the United States in search of that better life, leaving everything that she knew and loved behind. She met and married my father, also a Mexican immigrant, and had two children with him. My father left us when I was 11, and my mother, who until then had mostly been a stay-at-home mother, worked two jobs and sewed wedding dresses through the night to support us. She suffered the unbearable loss of my brother to a car accident, picked herself up, and proceeded to earn her college degree at the age of 54. She taught me that everything is possible through hard work. I came to Palestine 10 years ago to support the Palestinian negotiations team and pivoted to supporting entrepreneurs about a year after. I also met my biggest champion and cheerleader, my Palestinian husband, around that time. Five years ago, I co-founded Palestine's only venture capital fund, a fund that I championed, helped design, structured, and fundraise, along with a group of incredibly successful and supportive Palestinian businessmen and women. We launched the fund around the same time I gave birth to my son, and now we are about to launch a second, larger fund, and I am pregnant with my second child, a girl. Many were skeptical of a fund to invest in Palestinian tech startups, as many had tried and not done very well. We persisted and raised over $10 million, which we've now invested in 26 different companies. These companies have grown to sell in markets beyond Palestine, including throughout MENA, the United States, and Latin America. Many investors from outside Palestine have also joined us in funding these incredible companies. Our fund is one of the few in the MENA region with a female general partner. That would be me. And over the past five years, our fund has overperformed over funds across the world in terms of the number of women in which we have invested. I have no doubt, and research supports this, that one of the reasons for us investing in more women is because we have more women on our management team. Through our second fund, we hope to increase the number of women in our pipeline through increased management and support for I'm sorry, mentoring and support from our management team, as well as activities targeting women and their needs directly. We hope through these efforts to invest in an even greater number of women. We've also pledged to help our companies hire more women by maintaining a database of potential candidates. My hope is to grow this database to also provide training and development to these women to better prepare them for jobs with high growth startups. I know the situation of women around the world sounds pretty dire. Yet I strongly believe that it will only change when each of us does our part to help. We cannot wait for our governments to do so, although we must pressure them so that they act. And while there are many men who understand that these issues are important, we also cannot wait for every single one of them to make space around the table for us. So what can we do? For those of us in positions of leadership in our organizations, we have to encourage the hiring, retention, and promotion of more women. We can start by incorporating blind candidate selection throughout our hiring process, especially when it comes to promoting women, or promoting to first level management, which is where most women drop off. This means removing all identifying information until the last possible step. It also means not asking for pictures, age, gender, or mar marital status on CVs or applications. And every, every single one of us should remove them
from our CVs as they only invite discriminatory hiring practices. We should also set in place salary ranges for each position with clear performance indicators for the lower and higher end of each range. And remember that most women tend not to negotiate, so not only give the higher ends of those ranges to those that negotiate the hardest. We should set targets for women in positions of leadership throughout our organization, including in boards of directors. To retain more women, we should adopt or review our paid maternity and paternity leave policies. What are we saying to women by asking them to bear the challenges of a child's first weeks of life alone? And if COVID has taught us anything, it is that most white collar jobs can be done from anywhere. Continuing that trend and allowing that flexibility provides women the space to take care for their families, attend that football practice, make that doctor's appointment without guilt. Finally, we should all take the time to mentor younger women. We've all learned from our experiences and mistakes, and they can learn from them as well. For those of you just getting started in your careers, I encourage you to work on your sisterhood. Find that group of women that encourages you and supports you unconditionally. My sisterhood is here today, and I am so thankful to them. As your career progresses, you will very likely question yourself and your abilities. Go for it anyway. Go for that job for which you don't meet all of the requirements. Go for that master's degree. Go for that addition. Whatever it is your heart desires, you will never know if you could if you don't try. Ensure that you have that mentor or mentors to guide you through your career and always negotiate. It is expected, but do so intelligently. Be prepared to make a strong case for what you're asking for and be realistic. And finally, as you look for that life partner, Look for someone that believes in you and your dreams. I cannot stress this enough. I leave you today with a poem that inspired the title of today's talk, Legacy by Rupi Kaur, a 28-year-old Indian-Canadian poet. She wrote, I stand on the sacrifices of a million women before me, thinking what can I do to make this mountain taller so the woman after me can see farther. I ask you today, can you take at least one of my ideas and make this mountain taller for all of us? Thank you very much.